Thank you, Lord, that you are growing us up. Thank you more than anything, Lord. We thank you for your love, your kindness, your mercy, your grace, your compassion. We thank you that you are the God who sees and cares, who knows our every need. We love you, Lord. We thank you that we've gotten these last 10 weeks to come as sisters in Christ and learn and grow in you. Thank you for that opportunity. We just bless you, Lord. We just give you this time. We thank you for, for this class, that you have things to say to us personally, and we just open our ears to hear. Holy Spirit, touch us in our inner man, that we receive everything that you have for us. Just thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, all right, let's go to page three. Now, we have several pages here, but we're not going to have any problem getting through them unless I decide to talk a lot, which you never know. But three of the pages are just list of things for us to speak out and declare. Um, I was looking for, I was looking on YouTube, at like instrumental type music. Um, for something I was looking specifically for and I found several tracks where it was just like worship piano music and then it had scriptures that came up on the YouTube thing and I thought gosh there is so many ways out there for us to get the word in us and I actually I'm one of those people I jump around to all different things but we got to get the word in us we've got to um, get it coming out of our mouth. I was reading um, a Mike Bickle book just this last week, and he was saying how he has seen hundreds and hundreds and uh, thousands of people come through prayer lines and internships and schools out at IHOP, and they're like, I want passion for Jesus. I want to grow in my love for God. And he says, but that doesn't come through a meeting it doesn't come through a prayer line. Those things can help jumpstart us, but it comes through us getting the word of God coming out of our mouth to God. That we're talking to God about what he said in his word for our life. And it's the only way that comes. It takes time. It takes discipline. It costs you something. It does. It costs you something. It costs you Settling yourself down, not saying what you want to say, not allowing your mind to think all the things it wants to think, not allowing your emotions to take over. It takes us settling ourselves down and going, okay, God, this is what you said in your word. This is what you promised. You said that if we call upon you, you would hear, you would answer. This is what you said. And we, when we do that, I am telling you, it is the key to breakthrough in the area of our emotions and our thought life. It's just constantly connecting with the Lord. This is what you said. So in this class, we've gone through, you know, talking about the garden. And our, our soul is like this inner garden that we're sowing, we're watering, we're weeding, we're pulling up stuff. We're attentive. And we must be attentive to our gardens. Um, I, I don't know if I've talked about this. I've thought about talking about it, but I'm not sure if I said it something last week about it, but I'll just say it again. Um, when we've been um, launching the new church up in Greeley, we went through a lot of leadership training and we did like eight weeks of training. And every time we got together for training, we talked about culture. So what is the culture of our church? The culture of our church is to reach out to the lost. The culture of our church is to love the unloved. It's to walk in joy, you know, all these different culture things. And, and one day, all of a sudden, I realized the name of this class is Cultivating Your Inner Man, right? And I'm like, cultivating and culture, they have to be connected. And so I looked it up, and they are cultivating your garden is you're very careful to tend 
what is in there, what do I need to be removing out, what do I need to be placing in, and that is going to bring you to the culture of your life. We're, we're hearing that word a lot nowadays, the culture of a workplace, the culture of your church, the culture. Well, we have the culture of our self. What is your culture? Is your culture that you're always uptight? Is your culture when you dump things out in your car, you freak out? That would have been my culture five years ago. Now my culture is, well, praise the Lord. Here we go again. You know, we just have to, but we have to cultivate it. We have to cultivate what we want our culture to be like. We are a garden enclosed, a locked garden, a locked garden. We are a garden enclosed. Nothing has to affect our garden, only what we give it permission to affect. And I know that sounds big and I know that sounds hard, but it's true. Yeah, Diana. I think you're saying set our wills. Absolutely. That we're like, this is the way I want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Set our wills to follow the Lord with the help of the Holy Spirit. Yep. Yep. So he has to have our part, which is our set will. That says, Lord, I want to be a woman of love, of peace, of grace, of mercy. So I set my will and then I say, Holy Spirit, come and do that work in me. Come and show me those things that aren't the way they should be. I was talking to my daughter-in-law yesterday and they have across the street neighbors that are a mess. They are, she, she's laughing. She's like, they are the most worldliest people I've ever met. They are just sad and depressed and messed up. And she reaches out to them and she goes over there and talks to them. And she says, we're going to spend Thanksgiving with them. And I'm like, my mama heart is like, oh, I want you to be with me. <laughs> But I, I said that to Fred. I said, they're going to spend Thanksgiving with them. And he goes, ah, oh, that's so awesome. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> I forgot. We are supposed to be light and salt. We are supposed to be shining forth the love of Jesus. And so praise the Lord that Emma actually has a culture that's very, very loving and outreaching and including and it provokes me to go, I want to be more like that. And when we see things like that in people, we want to set our heart and go, God, okay, I want my culture to be more. I want to cultivate in me more love, reaching out um, at the new um, church campus um, that I'm a part of. I'm the head of the prayer ministry, so we pray and then I tell everybody, now go out there and meet people and ask the Lord for opportunities for him to highlight people to you and pray for people if you get an opportunity before service. Well, I pray for, I, I almost pray for one person every, every week before service that the Lord highlights to me. And I will tell you guys, I love people and I love to pray for people, that, but that was not me. That was not me. It was a new culture I set because I had the opportunity that was given to me. Would you like to lead a group of people in this way? This is our vision. This is our culture. I'm like, ah, okay. I can grab onto that. I can take a hold of it and I can bring it in other people into it. And I tell them that's not naturally me. I'm not naturally like, hey, let's run around. My mom is naturally nice and friendly to every human being in the world. Like when we're out and about, I'm like, oh, there she is talking to somebody else. She will pray for anybody, anywhere, all the time. That is not naturally me, but it's something I want in my garden. I want it to be a part of who I am. So I set my will and then I connect with the Holy Spirit in walking it out. So, um, what we're going to talk about today, I had these last three things that I clumped together and we talked a little bit about this first one last week on page three, halfway down, declare who God is. This is something I have told you guys, I think every week, if I haven't, I should have. This is what you have got to like be a fanatic about. God is good. He's faithful. He is so good. He has the perfect plan. 
My daughter-in-law actually called me about a, a job interview that she had with a paraplegic gal that needs a um, care person. And Emma is just telling me, it was a video call so I could see her, she's just telling me how much her heart was drawn to this woman and that they connected and and just the heart of God and and she wanted it was really cute because it's a Marco Polo where you're not live you send a video message then you send a video message and she said so I talked to Josh and Josh said talk to Jesus and then talk to my mom which is adorable that I think that that's the advice that he gives and uh, so she's she's telling me about this and I'm responding to it with you hear the Holy Spirit, and God's good, and he has the perfect job for you. And whatever he tells you to do, you do, and he will lead the way. And I believe that. I believe that. But I'm so glad I believe that. I'm so glad that I've gotten that in my, that that has become part of my culture, that that has become a strong part of my garden. And it came, it came to be because that's what I say. I needed it so badly in my life, I just started speaking out. God's good. He's got a perfect plan. I don't know what his plan is, but I like his plan. And it's a good plan, and I hear his voice, and I follow his voice. And God, you know, you are good. So we have to be having those things come out of our mouth more than anything else is the nature of God. It needs to be coming out of our mouth to our own soul to others around about us. I don't know what's going on, but he's good. He is only good. He is always good. He is good to you personally. He has an awesome plan for you. That's why my son Josh would say, call my mom. Um, one day, um, Emma was really frazzled about something, and Josh called me up, and he says, Emma needs to talk to you <laughs> and answer the phone. I'm like, okay, here we go. What's up? We need to be people that people, and I, you guys, it's not like I'm always thinking everything's great. I'm not always thinking everything's great. I'm making a choice to speak out. God is faithful. God has a good plan. It's not like I feel all happy roses and sunshine. I'm actually could be a bit of a pessimist in my normal nature. I would be bent that way. But since I have the Holy Spirit in me and I make a choice, this is the truth of our lives. There's no other option. God has good things for us and we need to declare them. So first and foremost, focus on this. God is good. God is good. There's this uh, new song. I don't know how new it is, but it's new to me. I think it's Hill Song. And some of y'all might know the line, but it says, Focus on this one thing. God is madly in love with you. Focus on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Every time, I mean, I play that song probably once a day. I don't know the name of it. Um, but that's the, that, and when it comes to that line, I'm like, focus on this one truth. He likes me. He's for me. He is on my side. So let's go to page four. Um, so so uh, the three things that, I would say our number one to sow into your garden is declare who God is, declare who you are or how God sees you, and then declare the promises of God. So declare who you are in Christ, how God sees you. I remember when I heard this message for the first time, I was probably, it was probably 25 years ago. Um, a gentleman by the name of Mark Hankins, his, his ministry is called In Christ, and he has a book that's called In Christ. And I had never really heard a lot of specific teaching of getting a hold of who you are in Christ. Because you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Because you are in Christ, you are beloved. You are 
it, God cherishes you. Because you are in Christ, you are free from the law of sin and death. Because you are in Christ, you are victorious. This isn't about us. It's about who we are in him. And when Jesus died, he took all of us upon himself and gave us all of him. So now we don't live in the natural. We live in the supernatural. But it's our choice. We can live in the natural if we want to. But we can choose to live in the supernatural. We can live in the natural that says, I'm just kind of negative and I'm critical by nature. Or we live in the supernatural that says, I have the spirit of Christ in me. I am full of the love and mercy and compassion of God. And so it's really our choice which one we want to live in. It's our choice. It's already been bought and paid for. It's already been given us. We've already been placed into him. Now we choose, do we want to live from there or do we want to live from the natural? Now, that's kind of what Diana was pointing out at the beginning is it's the setting of our will. But then what does it require? We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to empower us. It's not by might nor by power. It's not by us being strong-willed people or not. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to constantly, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, empower me. So we're going to look at page four. Um, It's kind of cool. We're going to look at two different disciples. And this is just a really good um, picture of living kind of like Mary and Martha. Now we love Martha. Martha's awesome. But I always, and I thought the other day, I hope I don't have to like apologize to Martha in heaven one day because I always use her as the example of we don't want to strive to be like Martha. We actually want to strive to be like Mary. But there still is things that we do like Martha. Do you know what I'm saying? We don't just sit on our rear all day and do nothing. There is things that we do. But we want to have that heart like Mary where we're sitting before the feet of Jesus. And so we have Peter and we have John. Now, I love Peter because Peter is fervent for the Lord, but he constantly messes up. He's awesome. He's all of us, right? And so um, in this story... Uh, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He says, then Jesus says to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. Now, who is going to stumble? It says all of them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep and the flock will scatter. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And he meant it. Like he meant it. In the Song of Solomon, there's a part where the maiden says, I am dark but lovely. And the whole thought is realization that I am weak. I have a sin nature. In and of myself, I do not have what it takes. But I am lovely before the Lord. I have the Holy Spirit within me. I have him to empower me. Peter didn't have that grasp. Peter was very confident in Peter. And he meant it. He meant it when he said, they all might stumble, but I'm not going to. Verse 34, Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So said all the disciples. Isn't that great? Peter's like, yeah, haven't you ever been in like a service? Everybody's like, yes, let's give everything to Jesus. We will lay down. We will do everything. And everybody's like, yeah, because it becomes like this total. It's not so much a heart thing as just an emotional reaction. And it was like, Peter was serious. Peter really thought he had what it takes. And the other disciples were like, yeah, what he said, let's do it. Um, The problem with Peter was he had a lot of confidence in himself, even more than the word of the Lord. Jesus looked at him and said, no, and he was really specific. No, you will deny me three times. And he's like, no, I won't. 
He had this confidence in himself. Now, I'll tell you what, gals. We want no confidence in our flesh. We want 100% confidence in him. And I actually will use that phrase, God, I am confident of you in me. I am confident of you in Christina. I am confident of you in that person. We're not confident in ourselves. We're confident in him. What happens lots of times is people want to learn more about the Bible. They want to learn more about how to walk out this life. They want to learn how to be more of a successful Christian. But we have to connect with him. It's not being confident in our knowledge and in our self-ability. We want to be confident in him, in him empowering us. I can know a lot about how I should eat, how I should exercise, what I should do, and believe me, I do. I know a lot about it. And in and of myself, I cannot walk all that stuff out. I have to say, Holy Spirit, empower me to walk out this life. I know I should forgive quickly. I know I shouldn't get irritated. I know I should talk a certain way. In and of myself, I cannot do it. I know the word of God. I know what it says that's good for me and good for others. I am solid in this. In and of myself, I cannot do it. But I can call upon him. I am confident in you, in me, Lord. So we know what happened. Peter did deny Jesus. Then Jesus is crucified. He's resurrected. Man, y'all think about Peter. He was so, he was so gung-ho when they were in the, the garden and the guards come to arrest Jesus. Who did anything? Peter, man, he grabbed the sword. He chopped off the guy's ear. And then Jesus corrects him. I mean, he was, all, he was all there. He was ready to do this thing. In his human zeal, in his human ability and human effort, he was gung-ho. He was the one that got out of the boat when everybody else stayed in. He was totally zealous after the Lord, but he was a little bit too confident in himself. And we don't want that. We do not. We actually want to realize I am dark, but I am lovely before you. I have a sin nature. I am weak in myself, but in you, I can do all things. We see who we are in Christ. We are more than conquerors. We are victorious. Greater is he that lives in us than he that's in the world. This is the truth. But apart from the Holy Spirit, we're a mess. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we're not doing this thing well at all. And that's okay. It, I mean, it's good for us to be there. It's good for us to come to grips with, yeah, I don't have it. But you do, Lord. I actually don't have what it takes. But I have you living in me. And greater is he that's in me than anything else I come against. So let's go down to the bottom of page four. Anyone got anything to say? Okay. John 21, 15 through 17. Now, Jesus has died. He's been resurrected. He's actually shown himself to the disciples at this point. And the disciples are fishing, which is an interesting thing because Jesus had called them out of fishing to become fishers of men and to follow him. Do you know when they were in ministry with Jesus, that wasn't their livelihood anymore. They were with Jesus. I don't, I mean, they, I don't know how much they still fished during that three and a half years of ministry with him, but it was not their livelihood. They're out there fishing. Um, and so we know that they're out fishing and Jesus calls to them I, or, or he says to them, hey, have you catched anything? And they're like, no. It's like, ah, oh, throw it on the other side. They catch a lot. What does Peter do? Y'all, what does Peter do? He jumps into the water to swim to the shore to see Jesus. This is who he is. 
I love him. I love his fervency for the Lord. And so he gets on shore and Jesus is there cooking them breakfast. He's cooking them fish. It says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to him, Simon Peter, said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? There's a, there's a kind of a debate um, of what he's talking about. Do you love me more than these? Some people say, well, uh, is he saying, like, do you love me more than the other disciples? Do you love me more than these, as in the fish, your profession, what you're giving yourselves to, yourself to? Not sure what exactly he's asking him, but he says to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Now, what had Jesus called Peter to do from being fishing? He said, I, I don't want you to fish anymore. Be a, I want you to become a fisher of men. Okay, this is important, you gals. Peter's calling was to be a minister of the gospel. That was his calling. But he failed. And when he failed, he went back to his profession of fishing. And so Jesus is talking to him about something here. And you'll see the point that Jesus is making. He says, so do you love me? He's like, yes, I love you. Then feed my lambs. I have something written here. I didn't realize that. Jesus was telling Peter that if you love me, obey me and do your calling. He said, was, he not was not telling him. Thank you. Jesus was not telling Peter that if you love me, obey me and do your calling. But he was assuring Peter that your failure does not cancel out your call and assignment on your life. He's saying... It is because you love me that you are called. It is because you love me you are called, not because of your failure. It is not because it is our failure does not take away from our calling as a wife. Our failure does not take away from our calling as a mother. Our failure does not take away from our calling as a daughter and a friend. Our failure does not take away from our calling as service to others in the church. Our failure doesn't do that. Our love for the Lord is what enables us to walk out in our calling. And he's telling Peter, he's like, do you love me? Yes. Okay, then do what I called you to do. We're settled here. That's all that's required is that your heart is mine, that you love me. He goes on, he says, verse 16, it's halfway down. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, then teach my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, I like this. You know all things. You know that I love you. He says, and feed my sheep. Isn't it interesting that he added that that third time? Some people say that Jesus asked it three times because uh, Peter denied him three times. It was three times he got to reinforce, yes, that I love you. I think, you know, it's so cool to see this here because the question was not asked so Jesus could have information. The question was asked so Peter could get a revelation. That he could get a revelation. You, oh, wait. God, you know everything. You know my heart. You know that I love you. I actually like to use that as a phrase in prayer. Every once in a while, it'll pop out. God, you know all things. You know that I love you. Remember how we were talking about last week? Our love may be weak, but it is sincere. Our love may be lacking, but it's real love. I really love the Lord. We really love the Lord. And he looks at us in Christ as daughters that are crazy about their daddy. That love their daddy fervently. Even on the days where we're numb and we're busy and we're just not connecting. He looks at us and he knows that we love him. 
We need that coming out of our mouth. It was Peter's genuine love for Jesus that qualified him to serve as an apostle, not Peter's ability to not fail or stumble. Weak love is still love. Weak love is still real love. Even in our weakness, when we're grieved over the way we talk to somebody. Do you know why you're grieved? Because you love the Lord. People in the world aren't grieved. They think that was cool that they put somebody down or put someone in their place. Weak love is genuine love. So Peter is our example of someone who's super confident in Peter. He fails, but then Jesus reestablishes him in, hey, remember, it's about your love for me, not your ability to not fail to not fall, to die for me, to never deny me. That, that isn't what our relationship with the Lord is based on. This is huge. It's huge when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, and it's huge when we look at the people in our lives that we see, and we're like, oh, they're not really doing this very well. But man, the smallest amount of love the weakest love is still love to the Lord. He still counts it precious to him. Uh, page five, let's go to where it says John's identity. Anyone got anything they want to share there? How, y how are you all with this? Yeah? Are you good, Sandy? I'm so proud of you. I am naturally really hard on myself. And so I, um, I really push into being like John. And we're going to look at John here in a second. I really push into being like Mary. It's like I'm naturally a Martha and I'm naturally a Peter. And I set my heart to be a Mary and I set my heart to be a John. And we can do that. The Lord can just transform us into being more dependent on him, more in love with him, more ability to put down our own opinions and our own emotions and take on his heart. He can do those things. So halfway down page five. Yeah, Sandy. Yeah. And report. So I went to a Sozo conference on Saturday with Pastor Bill. Uh-huh. And I took several people with me who I felt needed. They needed to be sozoed? <laughs> they needed sozo. If, if y'all don't know what sozo is, it's um, a type of prayer ministry that kind of helps you connect with the Lord one-on-one -on -one and hear from him and walk through a lot of childhood trauma or inward issues steps. and forgiveness. forgiveness. Yeah. So he asks, he has you pray. And he says, what is the Lord showing you? Uh, what is the lie? Yep. And it was absolutely instant when the Lord said to me, your issue is that you've never felt like you measure up. Right. Yep. So I was third girl, supposed to be a boy for a rancher with a 5,000 acre ranch. Mm-hmm. My parents never, ever made me feel like I was sorry that I wasn't a boy because okay. I became a tom girl. Yeah. And I followed my dad around. But my older sisters were more like my mom. And my oldest sister, who was like a second mother, was always correcting me. Mm -hmm. So I had to grow up and kind of say, you know, when she picks hairs off of me and tells me my makeup mm -hmm. streaked, and that's that's my asset. That's mm -hmm. not my liability. Mm -hmm. I need to say, oh, thanks. I didn't get that yeah. wiped out clear. Yeah. And, and and yet, Satan's under there saying, you really don't ever measure up. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, we went on a party together, the girl's mom, who's 99 okay. and vibrant. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, I think you're OCD, because I was telling them to straighten their cards while we were playing canasta. Oh, <laughs> that's me. Well, that has stuck in my crumb. 
she said, I think you've got OCD. Yeah, yeah. And yet she'll come right up to me just the other day and said, hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your OCD, not your OCD. My, my, my little girl was rising. Yeah, up yeah. That that Satan whisper of you're not, you don't measure up. So transform that to my husband. He has somewhat of a gruff voice. Okay. At certain times of his life. And I said to him one day, it's how you say it. It's not that you ask me to do it. I don't mind doing it. I don't even mind your criticism. I don't like your tone of voice. Oh, it doesn't matter what I say. You'd say that. Mm-hmm. No. No. So I get to Tozo, and what do you think? The first thing he says to me, the lie is that you don't measure up. Right. And that's yeah. why you take issue with right. his tone of voice, yep. with your sister rubbing your, picking your hairs off of you and straightening your collar. And... So what is the truth? And he just poured out tons. Well, so this carried into yesterday. Everybody leaves. Mom's in the bedroom sleeping. I go out and jump on my horse. Mm -hmm. And we rode. And God talked. Mm, <laughs> it was that's like sweet. pouring into me. Yep. You're weak. Yeah. You're weak, baby. But I've got you. That's right. I think you're wonderful. And it was so fun. That's so awesome. So something that's key that Sandy, and I know we talked about it at least once during the last 10 weeks, but it's really key, and it was a, a key breakthrough in my life, was to learn to say, God, what is the lie I'm believing here? Because I have these negative thoughts, these negative emotions, these um, negative, you know, desires, pulls for a reason. So what is the lie that I'm believing? And the lie you believe can actually be a fact. It's really important to understand those things. The fact is we aren't enough. The fact is we don't in and of ourselves. We can never be perfect. No one here, no matter how much you strive, you will never get it right completely. That is, that is a fact. But the lie is that that means something about who I am, how my father sees me, how I can relate to others. The, the level of affection or approval I get has to do with the level of perfection I walk out in. That's the lie. And then we ask the Lord, what is the truth? And that was actually really cool. It was before um, Fred and I ever took the life curriculum, which was about four years ago with Pastor Bill. And in that curriculum, they talk about the lie and the truth. And it was actually during my low days. And I was saying, Lord, you know what? And the Holy Spirit actually taught me to do that before I ever heard anybody saying it. Was, you know, what is the lie? What is the lie that I'm believing here? And for me, it was a lot of fear about my son. And I was like, Lord, what's, what, what do you, what's the lie here? And he would talk to me about the lie. And then I say, what's the truth? The truth is I will complete the work I began in him. The truth is the perfect love casts out fear. The truth is, so then I had to start talking to God about the truth he had revealed to me, not the lie the enemy was trying to take me out with. So often we get stuck on the line. We know it's a lie and we know it's the trick of the enemy, but that's where we get stuck. We're like, God, I just don't want to walk in fear about this. God, would. even on the way to church this morning, uh, the last week I've been having some um, thoughts. I don't call them tormenting thoughts. They're just those little picky thoughts, like little bits of fear about a certain person in my life trying to come in. And I know them. And I recognize them because when you get good at this, you see those things like that. I'm like, oh, no, no, we're not going there again. So I would just say, no, in the name of Jesus, that's not the truth. This is the truth. Well, on the way to church this morning, I was just praying in the spirit and had one of those thoughts. And I was like, God, why, why have I been having these thoughts? Is there, is there something real to this? Like, is there a warning here? And he's like, no, it's just the enemy trying to torment you. Like, just as clear as can be. I'm like, okay, cool. So I know it's not real. I know it's not a warning. It's just the enemy picking on me. Guess what? 
Because I am in Jesus, I know I have authority over the enemy. Not because I did everything right yesterday. Not because I prayed a lot. Not because I read my word. Because I am in Jesus, I know I have authority over that. So then we step into the truth. Okay, in the name of Jesus, I tell those thoughts, stop. I don't agree with you. I don't believe you. I believe this. And I just started speaking out the truth over this person that the Lord has told me. We have to replace the lie with the truth. We have to replace it. We can't just reject the lie. We must replace it with the truth. So John's identity. Thanks for sharing that, Sandy. That was good. John's identity. John defined himself as the one that Jesus loved. Did you, did any of y'all ever think that Jesus really loved him more? I remember growing up thinking Jesus has a favorite and it's John. John is Jesus's favorite. And I didn't realize that the only person that ever said <laughs> that of him was John. It would be like if I referred to myself to you all, the gal that Jesus loves. I'm talking about myself, the gal that Jesus loves. That's literally, he referred to himself as the one that Jesus loves. I love John. John denied Jesus it, he ran away in the garden with all the others. Remember, he said, all of you will be scattered, and they all were. Did you know John was one of them who wanted to call down fire on the city that did not welcome them in the right spirit? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. You're walking with the devil right now. That was John. John messed up. John just didn't do this thing perfectly either. But somehow, John knew God loved him in the middle of it. So you have him at the Last Supper. He's leaning on Jesus. Jesus is talking about, hey, one of you is going to deny me. Peter's sitting over here. He's like, ask him who it is. He tells John to ask Jesus who it is. Just think about that. And what does John do? Hey, Jesus, who is it? John had this knowing. I am his favorite. I am the one that Jesus loves. I just love that. He just had this confidence in that. Um, in, on the middle of page 5, John 21, 20, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following who also had leaned on the Lord at the supper. He, that is it from the book of John. Peter didn't say that. John said that about himself. You know, it's like Elmo, how Elmo <laughs> refers to himself as Elmo. You know, it's like John's writing about himself. And instead of saying, Peter turned around and saw John, he said, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. I mean, just think about that. Okay, so we walk around and we say things. Sandy last week shared about her breakthrough in saying that she is God's favorite. So we walk around and we say, God, you love me. God, you're for me. God, I bring delight to you. I'm your favorite. I'm your favorite. And why do we say these things? We say these things. We don't say these things if they're not like little... Sometimes I think in the Christian world, we get like little phrases will like provoke God to do something. God, God's not moved in the sense of by us talking him into things. He's moved by our heart. And our heart says, God, here I am. I'm the daughter whom you love. He's like, that's right. That's right. Now, what is it you want to talk to me about? I mean, he loves. Uh, don't you guys love I love it that my son Josh is convinced that he's my favorite. He is. Emma one day said, he tells me he is your favorite. I'm like, really? He said that? Yes. And he's sure of it. He's like, yeah, I am my mom's favorite. I love it that Christina believes I am her, that she's my favorite. 
And Emma and I, we have this thing. I'm like, you know, you're my favorite. She's like, yeah, they are. Emma's my favorite Emma. Christina's my favorite Christina. Josh is my favorite Josh. I love them all uniquely. They're all mine. And that's how the father is with his children. He loves us. There's things about Josh that's only Josh that I love about him. There's things about Emma that's only Emma. And I love about her. Things about Christina that's only Christina. That's how the father is with us, his children. We are the ones whom he loves. Let's flip over to page six. We are beautiful before God. We are complete before him. We are lacking nothing before him. I think about how much us as human beings can love our people through all of their mess ups. And I just think about the father, how much he loves his children throughout history. He loves the ones that haven't even come to him yet. He cries out for them to know him. He loves our people so much more than we could ever love them. His heart looks at them. And, and I think sometimes we get tainted with like disappointment in others and we wish they would do that better or that better, you know. And the father, when we focus on how the father sees them, he, they ravish his heart. He is so in love with his bride. He's so in love with us. And when we stir that up in us, then we have love and mercy and compassion for others. Um, the other day I was riding in my car and I just do things in my car. And I went through like, I actually went through the alphabet, how I was talking about y'all with the characters of God. But I was just going all the, all the A's I could think of, all the B's I could think of. And then um, I had a long drive. And so then on the way home, I just started to think about um, gratefulness. And I just started to come up with all the things I love about my husband, all the things I love about my son, all the things I love about my daughter and daughter-in-law. Just starting to thank God for those things. Because it's so easy as human beings for us to go, oh, I wish they just didn't have that short of a temper. Oh, I wish they were more careful with their money. Oh, I wish, you know, we as human beings can easily pick out the negative. And we have to on purpose establish the thankfulness. And I'm just thinking so often we think of God that way. And he's like, oh, man, I wish you'd do better there. Oh, I wish you'd spend more time with me. Oh, I'd be, I wish you were more like Mary. And the Lord just sits there and he loves who we are in him. He, yeah. This came to my mind. Wouldn't it be amazing this Thanksgiving if we knew who we were going to be with? And we spent time before that day to just list mm. for each one of them and just slip it to them. Yeah. Even if it's just written down. That's so good, that, Sandy. Yeah. Wouldn't that be yeah. a Thanksgiving yeah. to remember? Yeah, totally. Because so many people have said in the last few days I've been in different circles, Let's just pray for the relationships as we oh, get together yeah. with family. Because we all know we've got those. You know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be cool yeah. to do that? I'm going to do that. Um, yeah, Paula. Sorry, making y'all cry right before Thanksgiving here, you know. Thank you for saying that because um, we're having Thanksgiving with my ex and his wife. Wow. Um, at my son's house. <clears throat> Not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> um, 
and I just and and my husband was like stay home and do our own thing and I was like no God will give us mercy and good for you be fine yeah you know but it's and then my daughter-in-law's mother and her ex-husband will be there wow grouping of the exes yeah (laughs) and you know what God has grace for that and just flipping our hearts in situations like that and thinking how much grace and mercy and compassion and love the father has given to us has bestowed upon us that we are called his children and that we can actually put that on other people that we can give them grace mercy compassion and love we're walking in the heart of the father yeah Jenny um, beautiful scripture for us as moms and with coming of Thanksgiving um, Psalms 128 3 I know you know it but it says your wife shall be a fruitful vine in the very heart of your home. Mm. So mm. we are the heart of the home. Yeah. Moms. We truly are. And we know what we'll face when we gather with our families. There's no family that isn't broken. Mm-hmm. There's no family that isn't hurting in some way. Or that we, we wish we could change the circumstance. It wasn't like we wanted. Yeah. And yet God still promises he works all things yeah. for good. But from our hearts, we are the heart of the home. Yeah. And regardless of what kind of spirits come in, yeah. we know that we radiate the love of God. Yeah. And we create an atmosphere of peace because of the Holy Spirit. Because what we need, we lift our hands and say, God, it's I good. receive patience, love. I receive your heart for each yeah. one, even the difficult ones. Yeah. And we won't be moved by mm-hmm. what we think might happen or spirits that might come. Back. Yeah. From us, the essence of Jesus will flow. That's good. And we're a fruitful body. That's right. We become fruitful. That's so good. Um, going off of something that Janny just said about that, um, something I learned from Mike Bickle a couple years ago was that, you know, we cannot get demons off of people. And when I say demons, that's pretty, it's pretty harsh, but there are people that walk around with a spirit of offense and a spirit of, um, of, of, judging and bitterness and things like that and though they have to they have to we have to we they have to release those things off their own lives but we are allowed to take care of them when they're around us we actually can take authority over demonic atmospheres cannot have a place in our presence and Um, That is something when I learned that when I went into family situations where there would normally be kind of some not pleasant interactions, I would just walk in and I would just be like, Lord, you know, on the way there, Lord, I just take authority over every demonic spirit, over anger, over bitterness, over jealousy, over criticalness, over judgment. It cannot manifest itself around me. It cannot have a place around me. I know, Cheryl, you've had, you've done this several times in family situations and they've seen a difference, that there is a difference when we say no You are not allowed to function in my presence because I contain the Holy Spirit. And that person, they can keep their bitterness and they can keep their offense and they can keep their anger, but they can't walk out in it around me. And we do those kind of things. Um, I really encourage you all, if you are not naturally somebody who exhorts others, become an exhorter. It will feel really weird at first. But you do it. And I mean, there is not a time I talk to my kids on the phone, I do not tell them how much I love them, how proud I am of them, how great they are, even when I don't think everything is right. I tell my husband every day how awesome he is. We are called to be exhorters. We are called to encourage even those people that we don't feel even deserve it, God has some grace and mercy that he wants to pour out on them. And so I just want to encourage you all about that. Page six. 
Yeah, please, Julie. Seek first the kingdom of God, and there's so many ways that we can do that. A lot of times we can think it means getting up in the morning and studying the Bible. Sure. Right? But I think uh, seeking the kingdom of God means in everything. In every situation. Be aware, like when we go into the middle of a family, what are we there for? Are we yeah. there to remember whatever? Or uh, We are there to glorify God. Yeah. And and but I think we need to do that intentionally. We need to go Absolutely. Those situations knowing that there's probably going to be situations but God, I want to glorify you. Mm -hmm. And if I'm the only one in the room that wants yeah. to yield to your spirit and, and bring forth the fruit and change the atmosphere, but it's not going to glorify me. Right. It's, glorify you. it's not about me acting right and being the sweet one. It's about me shining forth Jesus' character. So Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. And when Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, he tells it. It's very interesting because he's talking to Pharisees and he's talking to sinners. It actually says that in the crowd, there are Pharisees and then there are tax collectors and prostitutes, there are, uh, it, I forget what the Amplified says, but they're bad. And he starts to fashion this story about a father who gives everything to these sons, these two sons. The one goes out, he lives in vicarious living, he wastes his whole money on, on bad things, okay? And then he has the good son. And the good son stays there and he serves the father and, and does what he's supposed to do. And it says that when the bad son realized he needed to go home, that as he was on the trail home, the father saw him coming. The father was intentional. He was looking. He was waiting. And he came and he ran to him. And just think about Jesus is telling this to this crowd he makes it so bad to say the son had gotten so low. He had wasted all his money. He got so low, he started to feed pigs. And the Pharisees are like, oh, like, you know, that's like, this is bad stuff. It was like Jesus was crafting this. Yes, of all things. And he was eating their food because he was so hungry. Jesus is like building up this story of like, okay, what can I come up with that would really appall this group now? And the sinners are all going, oh my gosh, that's me. That's who I am. And the Pharisees are just appalled and disgusted. And then Jesus says that the father sees the boy from far off and he runs to him. And he brings him a coat to cover up his filth and his sin. He brings him shoes because only slaves wear or were, or were barefooted. He brings him shoes. He gives him the family ring, the family credit card that says, you are part of this family. Everything is mine, is yours. And you know what the son had done? Nothing. He had come home. That was it. So they're going to kill the fatted calf. They're going to have a feast. They're going to celebrate because the son that was lost is now found. And the good son. Now all the Pharisees are going, yeah, that's us, right? We're the good son. We do what we're supposed to do. We've served. We've done. He is mad. He's like, what? I have been here. I have done nothing wrong. I have served you. You've never even given me a calf, a, a young goat to have a party with my friends. I've done everything wrong, and you're going to have killed the fatty calf over this sinner's son that's come home? And the father says to him, he says, everything I have had has always been yours. See, lots of times us in the church, we live in this mentality that we're trying to earn and we're trying to deserve, we're trying to be good enough. And God's like, you've been with me always. Everything I have is yours. Everything. And so let's celebrate that this son that was lost is now found. It's just in this awesome picture of the father's heart that the father is looking. He's waiting. He covers. He restores. He repairs. He, we don't have to earn. The sinner doesn't have to earn. The saint doesn't have to earn. We are all just part of the family and 
God is our Father. He loves us. We are beautiful before Him. Page six, we grow in confidence in the Lord as we focus on His love for us. We are not called to walk in condemnation, but we are called to see ourselves as beautiful before God. I am beautiful before God. He looks at my personality. He looks at my callings. He looks at my friendship with him. And he rejoices that I'm his daughter. He rejoices. Use, yeah, he sings over us. He dances over us. We look at him and, and I just, I just, want to encourage you all look at the father go to him father here i'm your daughter your favorite one the one whom you love the one whom you delight in you're crazy about me god is madly in love with me he loves me psalms 90 verse 17 and let the beauty of the lord be upon us and establish the works of the, our hands for us. Yes, establish the works of our hands. Shame, disappointment, and self-pity, regret are all lies of the enemy that want to fill our garden and take over the good fruit. We have to break agreement with those lies. Every time shame tries to come on us, every time disappointment tries to come on us, we break those lies. We say, no, I am beautiful before God. He loves me. He chases after me. Uh, Mike Bickle, one of uh, the books that he's famous for is called Passion for Jesus. And he did Passion for Jesus conferences for years and years and years. And um, he says, the main way I tell people to get passion for Jesus is to discover his passion for you. When we discover God's love and passion for us, his bride, our heart grows in passion for him, just naturally. We love him because he first loved us. And when we know that love, it compels more love. So we want to see who God is. God, you're good. God, you're faithful. We want to have coming out of our mouth how he sees us. I am your daughter. I am bought with a price. I am cleansed with the blood of Jesus. I am who you say I am. I am more than a conqueror. Um, let's go page seven. That's just a list of what I put together off the internet. You can find tons and tons and tons of these. Page seven, I just recommend, my husband Fred, he's had a list of these in our bathroom for years and years and years and years on a piece of paper that he has sitting out and it's just the i am's that i am loved by god i am a friend of jesus i am dead to sin and alive to god if you've never been somebody who does this kind of meditates on stuff you don't just read through it you're like i am free from all condemnation Thank you, Lord, that I don't feel condemned anymore about that situation. I don't feel condemned about my past. You, you dwell on it. You talk to him about it. This is a list of things that God asks you to talk to him about. He wants to talk to you about this. I am free from the power of sin and death. I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. If I'm a joint heir with Christ, that means I am in standing with Jesus as one of God's children. Jesus is God's son. I, he is my brother. I am in standing with Jesus. I am a joint heir. What belongs to Jesus belongs to me. Right? And we stop and we think about those things. We talk about them. I am more than a conqueror through Jesus. Where do I feel conquered right now in my life? That's a lie from the devil. I am not, I'm not depressed. I'm not discouraged. I don't walk in regret. I am more than a conqueror because I am in him. And we do that. We, we speak those things out. We declare them. We meditate on them. Meditate means you just go over it in your mind or with your mouth where you're not just speaking it out, but you're actually thinking about 
What does it mean? I am a child of God. He loves me. I, I like to get the picture of me grabbing like I'm a little girl in a crowd and I'm grabbing my dad's hand and he's just leading me through it. I'm a child of God. He cares about me. He, he's not letting go. He has a plan. He, he is really, really good. He's really, really kind. And we meditate on that. We have it coming out of our mouth. We have it coming out of our mouth about ourselves. We have it coming out of our mouth about others. What that does is when we speak out things about others, like I thank you, God, that you have a plan and purpose for their life and you are fulfilling it. I have released the life of God to them, but I have also released the life of God to my emotions about them. So it affects them, but it affects me just as much. That I'm like, that's right. God loves them. God has a plan. He's doing good things. That's right. I don't need to worry. I don't need to be stressed. Page eight. Anyone got anything about that? Yeah, Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, but just over the last couple of years, this thing that we are not, we always strive for the victory. Yeah. Give me the victory. Yep. Give me the victory. Yep. We're working for victory, but what God is saying is we need to be working from victory. Yeah. The victory is already That's there. That's right. So we need to focus on the victory. We've won all of this. It's all of us. It's our identity now. Instead of trying to strive to it, yep. get the victory. Yep. So, so I like to I like to use this picture where it's like um, God is like a waterfall. It's all of His goodness, everything He's provided, everything He's done, and we have a choice how close to the waterfall we want to get. We can stand on the peripheral, we can get the mist, or we can go right in, and we're like, "Yeah, I receive everything You have for me." It's not. It's not. I'm not doing anything. Like, come on, waterfall get more, it's actually I'm positioning myself and going, God, you're the God of love and mercy. God, you're the God of healing and compassion. That's who you are. I position myself under you because one of his names actually means pourer forth. He is the pourer forth. He pours out. He lavishes love. It is, it's ridiculous love. It, it, it doesn't make any sense to our mind. It's so undeserved. And he lavishes it out on us and on all of our people. All the time. It just matters, do we want to put ourselves in the place where we're receiving it? Which is what we've been talking about in this whole class is putting yourself in that position with the Lord where you're like, yes, I agree with what you said. Now I receive what you said. Which actually leads us to this third one is declaring God's promises what Jesus provided for us on the cross. And I actually put these in order for a reason in this order. I, I believe that this is the order of importance when these come to. First and foremost, we must know God is good. Now, if I know that Jesus provided healing for me on the cross, but I don't know that God's good and it's in his heart for me to be healed, then I'm not going to be able to receive the promise. I have to know he's good. Jesus comes and there's this leper. And the leper asks Jesus, Jesus, he knows he can heal him. He's heard the stories. And, Jesus, and he says to Jesus, I know you can heal me. If you will, if it's your will, if you desire to. And do you know what Jesus said to him? It's my will. He didn't just heal him. He actually told him, no, it is my will. I want to do this. And what's super cool about that story is then Jesus actually reached out and touched him, which was unheard of. You do not do that. It was actually against the laws of the church, of the Jewish church of that time, but Jesus did not only proclaim, yes, it's my will, he loved him enough to touch him and minister the life to his body. 
But we must know God is good. We must know he loves us for us to be able to walk out in all of his promises. And so often, us in the church have gotten that backwards where we're trying to receive the promises without having that connection and heart of knowing God, of knowing that he really, really likes us. Do you guys see the importance there? We're trying to walk in the promises without walking with him. So, um, I'm just going to go over this quickly. It's, it's not needed as much as I did. Um, on the cross, Jesus, he uh, bought a, atonement. Atonement is the removal of our sins. Our sins were taken off of us and placed upon him. Our sins for all times. Now, you can hold on to your sin if you want to. <clears throat> you can be like, yeah, I'm just that way, or I just am that way, and I'm just, I'm just a gossip, or I'm just a bitter person. And you can hold on to it if you want to. But Jesus made a way. He atoned for it. It does not, the power of sin and death does not have power over us. Y'all, we don't have to walk in it. We don't have to walk in bitterness. We actually can go to a situation like you're going to, and you can be fine with everyone in the room. I mean, it's possible through the power of the cross. Jesus paid for it. Um, the Lord had laid on him the iniquities of us all. That's your sin and all those really bad sins you know out there that pe other people have done. He has taken them all. Propitiation is the removal of God's wrath. God is not disappointed in us. He's not mad at us. He hates sin and he hates it what it does to his children. But he has no anger or wrath towards his children at all. I just think about at times how angry I've gotten towards people. And if we stop and we think Jesus took God's anger upon himself at the cross, there is no anger in the Father towards his children, none. It's crazy how much when we dwell on something like that, how it can change our perspective towards ourselves and then our perspective towards other people. Um, reconciliation is the removal or the separate, of the separation from God. Sin separates us from God, so he sent Jesus to die for our sins so that we could be in relationship with him. If we feel distant, it's not God. It's us. It's where we're positioning ourselves. Yeah, if you don't feel close to God, consider who moves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so true. It's not, he said, he promised he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. The distance, when we feel that distance, it's probably a lot of busyness in our mind, a lot of business in our emotions, a lot of weeds in our garden. It's not God. It's our ability to position ourselves before God. And we want to fight for that. We want to fight for no feeling of, because he made the way for us to be reconciled. Let's go up to the top of page nine, redeemed. The fall put us into capacity to sin and death. Captivity, sorry. The fall put us into captivity to sin and death. Jesus paid the price to redeem and ransom us from that captivity. Every time you feel that pull of the flesh towards an area of anger, of bitterness of judgment, of criticism, you declare, I'm redeemed from that. I don't have to walk in that. That does not have power over me. I actually got prayer, prayer this last Sunday from two members on my prayer team. And uh, it was for this sinus junk that I've been fighting. 
and they're they're actually older than me they're on, the only people on my team that I think are and um, they're praying for me and then he goes have you been overly critical towards anyone lately and I kind of looked at him and you all know me I'm real I'm not like oh no I don't walk in that I'm like well, I really, I really watch against that because it's actually a tendency of my flesh. So I really guard against that. And then all of a sudden this name popped in. I was like, oh, I have been. Yep. I know exactly who it is. You know what? I didn't feel guilty or bad. I just repented. I didn't be be beat myself up. I just repented. God didn't do that to go, oh, Carrie's being bad. Why'd he do it? He wants me free. He doesn't want me carrying around stuff that's not mine. So we just go, oh, great, thank you, God. Okay, he's like, oh, you know what to do. And so we just prayed through that and broke that thing off. And I'm like, no, I'm not walking in that. We are redeemed. We are not captive to it. It does not have power over us. The enemy only has the power over us. We give him. He wants to shut our mouth towards God. He wants to shut our mouth to proclaim truth. He wants us crabbing and griping and complaining and agreeing with the lies. He wants us to. But the Lord is calling us into truth. Halfway down page 9, it says victory. Jesus defeated the enemy and won us the victory. No longer does the kingdom of darkness have power over us. It doesn't have power over us. Okay, drop down to the bottom of page 9. This is from Song of Solomon. I'm going to read it in the New King Translation and then the Passion Translation. Um, this is the Shulamite speaking. She's the maiden. She's us. Um, it says, A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. Now in the Passion Translation, a sachet of myrrh is my love, like a tied up bundle of myrrh resting over my heart. Um, in the box, the uh, Cambridge Bible of Schools and Colleges says, a bundle from Isaiah 3.20, we learned that the Israelite women were accustomed to carrying perfume boxes. The bundle of myrrh here would seem to be something of that kind, probably a small bag of myrrh resin in it. Flip over to page 10. Myrrh <clears throat> is used, just to give you that this is what we do in the Song of Solomon class. We read a verse and then we talk about the spiritual meaning of it. So this is just an example. Myrrh is used to make a fragrant perfume to prepare a body for burial. The maiden feeds, feeds on the truth of Jesus as the one who values her so much that he went to the cross that he could be in relationship with her. She is focusing on this truth of the cross and what the Lord has done. The Passion Translation footnotes. This bundle of tied up myrrh is an incredible picture of the cross. Myrrh, known as an embalming spice, is always associated with suffering. The suffering love of Jesus will be over her heart for the rest of her days. The revelation of our beloved tied on the cross like a bundle of myrrh. It's this holding tight. Jesus, what you did for me. Jesus, what you did for me, you purchased all for me. You purchased peace for my mind. You purchased health for my body. You purchased strength for my inner man. You purchased it for me. It says that she's lying all night with it tied over her heart. In the darkest of times, Jesus you made the way. You paid the price. It's not by my works. It's not by my striving. 
It's not by me trying harder. It's by what you purchased for me. With your own body, on the cross, you did it all. And we actually need to plant in our garden those truths. We need to water them with our mouths. We need to, we need to cry over these things. We need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, give me revelation. Give me a tenderness towards what Jesus did for me. Cause me to have a gratefulness in my heart. Why? Because it changes us. It completely changes who we are. We become gracious people. We become kind people. We become bold. We become bold about, about talking to people about, no, the enemy doesn't get that in your life. This is the truth. Let's pray about this. I have a, a young man up at the new campus in Greeley. He's um, the head of the ushers, and he works with Fred, just a really nice young guy. And two weeks ago, uh, he said to me, hey, I have a coworker. He does not know Jesus. I've been asking him to church. He hasn't come yet. He is, has cancer and um, lymphatic cancer. And he goes, I just really want, I'm like, oh yeah, we're praying for him. We're praying that this is a wake up call for his life, that he's going to come to know Jesus and that he will be healed. And he's like, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you for. I'm like, okay, we're doing it. So I've been praying for him. See, we want that boldness in us. We want the confidence. That doesn't come from faking it. It comes from speaking it out. Jesus, I know this is who you are. If I'm wondering if God's nice, if I'm wondering if it's his will to heal, if I'm wondering all these things, am I going to do that? No, I'm going to say something like, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, that would be good if he came to church. But if I'm daily talking to the Lord about his kindness and his goodness, if I'm daily talking to the Lord about how much he loves me and his bride, if I'm daily talking to the Lord about how much he's purchased for us and done for us on the cross, then we come to situations like that and we have a boldness. Yeah, God's good. He's made a way. We're going to ask him to move in this person's life. That's where that comes from. Not acting, it's from becoming. Becoming confident in your garden. This is who he is. This is what he's done. This is what he wants to do because he likes us all a lot. And we just say it over and over and over in as many different ways as we can come up with to do it. So... Halfway down, page 10. Anyone got anything? I'm going to be listening to this message again. I need to stir this up in me. I need to stir it up in me that this is what, how we do this thing. We do it by connecting with him over and over. We talk to God about what he wants us to talk to him about. Yeah, Julie. We've been, um, talk up. We've been going through a study, and the, and the guy said just really quick, when, like in Revelation, where he says, I have this one thing against you, that you left have your left first your first love. love. Yeah. And earlier it says, we love him because he loved us first. Mm -hmm. I think this is just so incredible because I think it's something God is doing is bringing back the revelation he is. of his love for us. Mm -hmm. And those of us, I think, that have been around a long time, it's like, wow. Yeah. I'm finally getting that. Yeah. You know, yeah. because even though we've known it, we haven't really known it, and he's restoring. He's saying, I "Can't go a lot much, uh, much further until you get." That's good. Much I love yeah. You. No, I it's love so it. true. And and what it is so important is that we don't just connect with it and go, "Oh, I really like what she said." Yeah, that's true. It's we get it in our language. We get it before our eyes. We purpose. I don't care how much my inner man. My soul is fighting. My flesh doesn't like this. I don't care how much my mind wants to talk me out of this. I refuse to be left behind. I refuse to be that person who just goes through this life making it by. 
I refuse to not grab onto his love and have it become so part of who I am. I want to be somebody that not just says it, but knows it. Like, I know God is for me. I know he is on my side. I know he is working things out for me and my people. I know when I talk to him, he listens to me. And he takes it serious. That's what you said to us when you were in your depth of struggle Mm -hmm. with Josh. Yeah. I don't care what happens here. Mm -hmm. I got to be right with you. Yep. And we do. We have to fight for that. That has to be our first and our most. God, I want you. I want to understand who you are. So, halfway down 10, 2 Chronicles 1, 7 through 12. I love this story. I love what it shows. On that night, God appeared to Solomon. Y'all know this story. And said to him, ask, what shall I give you? Y'all stop. I mean, come on. God shows up and says, what do you want? That's a tough one. I remember um, Pastor Jonathan sharing one night when he was about 16. The Lord came to him in a dream. He had a dream. And in the dream, God came to him and said, ask me for anything. And he sat there and he said he was so scared that he would not ask the right thing. And so he said, what should I ask? Which I thought that was beautiful, right? And God says, ask me to stay. And when he told that story, of course, I just was like, oh, man, that what, what should I ask for? Ask for me? Ask for me? God, what should I ask for? Ask for me. So he says, um, he says to Solomon, what do you want? Like, ask. And Solomon said to him, you have shown me great mercy. You have shown great mercy to, my, uh, to David, my father, and have made me king of his palace. I think this is interesting. It's kind of like he's processing out loud here. Now, O Lord God. Let your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. And this is what he asked for. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? Then God said to Solomon, so pretty much what he asked for, he asked for discernment on how to lead the people that God had given him. I think it's a pretty noble request. And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart. Now listen to this, gals. This is how God saw his request. He said, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked for long life. Aren't those all things we would normally ask for? You would think, I want to live long. I I don't know about the taking care of the enemies thing, but that would be them in those days. I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. He says, because you haven't asked for those, but you ask for wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge your people over whom I have made you king. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor any that are after you. And I just want to encourage you all, ask for the right things. I mean, so often, yes, we pray these awesome prayers, and we need to be praying that God moves in all the different ways we want him to move. But most of all, ask for him to captivate your heart. Ask him to capture you with his love. Ask him to cause your heart to be on fire for him first and most. That you fall in love with his face and you fall in love with his ways. Ask him for those things. And he'll give you all the rest besides. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to be putting on. Look at him. And um, I tell a story about one day I was in the prayer room 
And I was pacing and praying, and I was praying mom prayers. I was praying for my kids. Both of them were doing missions at the time. I was praying for um, provision. I was praying that God would, you know, move on their heart. I was praying for their future spouses. I was praying, you know, just mom prayers, protection and health. And I'm pacing and praying, and I feel the Holy Spirit kind of like, like, okay, dial down and just listen. And this is what starts coming out. God, more than anything, get their hearts. Chase after them with your kindness. Show them your mercy. Captivate them with your love. More than anything, I want them to love you. Pursue them. Do not relent until you have all of them. And those are the first and the most prayers for us and for our people. Do not relent until you have all of my heart. Do not relent until you have captivated me with your love that I see your beauty and your goodness more than anything else. Don't stop. God, when I ignore you, get my attention with who you are. God, when I'm walking in fear and doubt, show me your goodness and your might. God, when I'm trying to figure things out, show me your faithfulness. Get my attention. This is what I want most. I want to be with you. I want you to stay. I want you by my side more than anything else. Problems will come and problems will go, but he will always be with us. And it's us making that choice to connect with him, to truly draw to his side, to truly honor him in our lives as being the most important thing that we cannot live without him. We cannot go through our day without him. I must have you. I must have you. So, Father, right now, we just come before you. We just say we must have you. You are our first and most. You are our prize and our goal. Show us your beauty. Show us how you see us, Lord. I pray right now for every gal in this room that they would continue to have a daily encounter with your love. A daily encounter with your kindness. Lord, we ask you to move as only you can move in our hearts and the hearts of our people. <clears throat> Lord, right now we give you us. We give you everything in our life and we give you everyone. And we ask you, Lord, cause us to trust you with all of it. We must have you. We thank you, Lord, that you never leave or forsake us. You walk by our side. You are the generous God and you are generous with your love and compassion and mercy towards us, towards our people. Thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord. Grab a hold of our hearts more. Do not relent until you have all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father, we lean in. We lean into what you're thinking, what you're saying, Lord. It's what matters. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for who you call us. We are your daughters. We are your princesses. We are your favorite ones. We are the one in whom your soul finds delight. You delight over us, Lord. You delight over us. 
Jesus, we thank you for what you purchased for us. We thank you that we are not we are not captives to sin. We are not captives to bitterness, self-pity. We're not. Just say out what you're not a captive to. We are not captives to the lies of the devil. We're not captives to fear. We're not captives to worry and anxiety and depression. We are not. We're not captives to those things. We are not captives to the opinions of others. We are not captives to the fear of being alone. We're not captives to the lie that we have to earn our worth and that we're not enough. We call those lies and we replace them with the truth. The truth is that we are daughters of the Most High God who loves us, he delights in us, he brags to others about us. He is crazy about us. He only wants good. And he has a plan for it in our lives. That is the truth. That is the truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, thank you for making the way. Thank you for making the way to the Father. Thank you for making the way to walk in healing. Thank you for making the way for provision in our life. Thank you for making the way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your unfailing love. Thank you for your protection. Thank you that you supply all of our needs. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're our helper. Thank you. We thank you. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning, Lord. That you are faithful and you are kind. Thank you. We grab a hold of it. We say it's ours. Now, Holy Spirit, right now, we ask you to fill us up. Let's all put our hands out. Fill us up, Holy Spirit. Fill us up with the truths. We surrender to you. We know in ourselves we can't do this. But we say with you, we can. With the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we are confident of you in us. Now fill us up more. Overflowing. Truth. Life. Wash away the lies. Fix the broken parts. Restore and repair. Go in there, Holy Spirit. Physical healing, mental healing, emotional healing. We receive it now. We receive it now. It's ours. Jesus bought it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We just say thank you. We receive it. It's a gift. We say thank you. Fill us up. Fill us up. It's ours. We thank you for that. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And the Lord just says, it's okay. You don't have to be sad. You can be happy. You don't have to mourn. You can rejoice. You don't have to worry. You can walk in confidence in me. You can. It's okay. He's got it. He's got it. It's his. We give all to you that is not ours to carry. We receive all from you that has been purchased for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that right now. Thank you, Lord. Just love you, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, Lord, I just bless this class, and I speak peace over their holidays. I speak peace over Thanksgiving and over Christmas, over the New Year's. I speak your peace and your joy. Lord, everyone that's got some big, hard plan, Lord, I ask you to dial it down. Dial us down, Lord. 
simplify our lives, help us to choose peace and joy and and that we would truly enjoy our families and our friends. I just feel like the Lord keeps saying it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be hard. So often we come into agreement with the lie of the enemy that says, oh, we're going to be around this group of people. It's going to be hard. Oh, we got to do these things. It's going to be hard. Oh, we got to get this done. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be hard. Lord, we just lay down that lie right now. and We take on that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We agree with that truth. You said, Jesus, to come to you. We do. We give you all. We take on your rest. We take on your yoke. Our soul is at peace. Holy Spirit, point out the weeds. Fill us up with the truth. We delight in being children of the King. We delight in being your daughters and your friend. We delight in being loved by you and cherished by you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you that we are yours. Thank you. We delight in you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.